regulatory systems are important and key to delivering quality uh, health systems. Without well-trained and competent staff, it's impossible for regulators and regulatory initiatives such as those at the regional level and hopefully AMA very soon to deliver on their mandate. Training programs are needed that deliver competencies against the WHO competency framework for regulators. This could be run as in-house uh, training by in-house training units within NRAs or externally by training institutions linked to NRAs to offer practical experiential learning. Learning by doing through twinning and fellowship programs have served well to develop regulatory leaders over the last decades and would like to continue to support and be involved in such initiatives. Assessment of whether programs are able to deliver and provi provide the, the promised skills and competencies is critical. And without these assessments, it becomes difficult to justify whether programs are actually delivering on, you know, delivering skills and competencies to their trainees. So in order to assess skills and competencies gains, gained, we need to be innovative. This will also depend on whether we are talking about basic introductory level training or intermediate advanced levels uh, of, of skills and competencies. For the basics, uh, we can draw on lessons from the early days of the HIV treatment programs when thousands of doctors across Africa needed to be trained to deliver quality uh, ARV therapy, or from the US FDA's training program for first level assessors. In both cases, self led, personally paced courses were used that were online or CD ROM based at the time uh, that have inbuilt exercises and, and case studies that trainees take and receive automated results at the end of the, at, the, at the end of the evaluation. These generally serve well for knowledge and skills, but not for competencies. Once you get to the intermediate and advanced levels, there are no shortcuts. One needs to be engaged directly with the trainees, observe and assess their performance, and really work with them through real world conditions, including you know, them generating reports that one can look at and evaluate the level of skills and competencies that they have gained. These observations might be recorded, but eventually someone needs to review them and score the performance. Let me share a small story from my epidemiology capacity building days. I spent uh, over 12 years of my early career, you know, building epidemiology and laboratory competencies across Africa before I joined the, the Gates Foundation. And in that space, uh, to develop competencies, we call this shoe leather epidemiology. Uh, at the time, I think we still do. Uh, we believe that, you know, for a trainee to demonstrate that they can investigate an outbreak, they had to go out and investigate the outbreak and write a report. You know, if they needed, if you needed to demonstrate that they can run a surveillance system, you ask them to evaluate a surveillance system and report what is working, what is not working, etc. And this is similar even in with clinical skills. You know, surgeons learn by actually doing surgery. You know, you do a, a series of surgeries. The same is in the lab. And I think this is exactly the same even with regulatory that, you know, people have to learn by by doing and that's why we're really really delighted and thrilled about the training program that has been put together uh, by partners with you know as a pilot with SAPRA, MCSN and, and Ghana FDA involved uh, that is beginning to take the same journey whether it's the experiential learning whether it is the assessment of the trainees through observation and case studies and, and, and practicums and we're really really proud 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 of that and look forward to this program growing and expanding and contributing to the continent in building the skills and competencies of, of regulators and regulatory authorities across the continent so we as a foundation look forward to the opportunity to discuss these ideas with you and to listen to your experiences and perspectives and how we might together further the capacity building of regulatory authorities and embedding regulatory science and best practice science, as Tumi indicated, the evolution and the changes that we see every day and how we can embed that in the next generation, the current and the next generation of regulators and regulatory scientists. So thank you very much. I wish you all a very successful meeting uh, over the next two days. Uh, and uh, thank you very much for having us as part of this meeting. Thank you very much, uh, David. 
We'll then move to the next item on our agenda. Um, as we've said, we had a really a fantastic training program implemented last year um, <clears throat> with uh, having to implement it under COVID uh, regulations, lockdown regulations. We really had to uh, test some of the various digital platforms for the faculty um, to be able to deliver this work. But the benefit in that was that we were able to access the best when it comes to the faculty in that we didn't have limitations of people not being able to travel, et cetera, et cetera. So I do think that our colleagues uh, were able to get the best um, from this training. We're going to share with you a very short video. Um, and this is a video of the graduation, again, a virtual event uh, that we had of the graduation of our first um, uh, class that graduated from this uh, program. We'll play the video now. Invariably, so we will have a technical glitch, but um, I think we'll be able to sort it out soon. So we can see the video on our side. We're just not able to share the screen, but um, please give us a few moments. Good morning and welcome to this inaugural graduation ceremony for the short course in dossier assessment for clinical assessors within African regulatory agencies. As the Department of Pharmacy and Pharmacology at Wits University, we are extremely proud to be part of this delightful event in partnership with Pharmacometrics Africa to host you as the inaugural graduating class of 2021. The vision to co-host this learning program with Pharmacometrics was born out of the need to have a high quality learning platform to advance the education, training and capacity development in the pharmaceutical regulatory sciences. The need for such a learning experience for strong partnership between academia and industry experts is an ideal approach to train regulatory science practitioners who are well rounded to deeply understand the discipline. Uniquely, this short course addresses the review aspects of clinical data generation during the drug development process and its submission as part of regulatory dossiers obtained in clinical trials or by other means. This is a critical skill for regulatory professionals in the pharmaceutical industry and those working for government health product regulatory agencies. This type of training, which WITS is proud to be part of, addresses the current and growing shortage of a pharmaceutical regulatory workforce on the African continent for regulatory bodies as well as the sponsors who rely upon regulatory decisions. Collaborative regulatory science programs such as these can help address the need for capacity development in this area on the continent and that we produce regulatory practitioners who can make clinical, critical clinical decisions on product registrations that is based on the highest standards of quality, efficacy, and safety to ultimately safeguard patients. Professor Junara, graduating class of 2021, invited guests. 
In the very recent past, the majority of the work of an African regulator has been to review dossiers for generic formulations. Thus, a course for clinical assessors that covers innovative medicines rather than bioequivalents seemed like overkill. We might be teaching skills that might never be used. Like so many other areas of our lives, the pandemic has shown us that this will not be the case. African regulators have started to see more and more inquiries related to COVID-related diagnostics, vaccines, and therapeutics. Now, admittedly, there was an initial slow start to this. So it is not just generics that African regulators encounter. And we hope that this trend will continue, that international pharma companies will lodge dossiers for innovative medicines here in Africa at the same time as in the global north, rather than years or decades later. Our patients should not have to wait that long for life-saving medicines. I want to acknowledge that there are several university programs and courses to upskill African regulators. But I also at the same time want to highlight some aspects to this particular course that these graduates are going through. Um, so for example, the, the, the syllabus focused on assessment of safety and efficacy data that a clinical assessor would encounter and the class comprised of practicing regulators. In this pilot course, we invited participants from three agencies, uh, South Africa, Ghana, and Zimbabwe, they were nominated, the participants were nominated by their agency management teams. And in the next iteration, we will apply the learnings from the current round uh, to the benefit of the new students and expand to new agencies. The program was fully virtual, comprising intensive and extensive course materials. Uh, the course materials would form a, a really good reference source for the participants. We particularly focused on the interaction between the regulator and the regulated and attempted to put the clinical assessors into the shoes of the sponsor who would be generating the data that they would ultimately uh, review. So in, in closing my brief comments here, let me express a few notes on behalf of the colleagues that I am representing at this graduation ceremony. I am very grateful to the international and regional faculty. A large number of subject matter experts very readily agreed to share their vast collective experience. Many of them are in the audience today. Uh, this enriched this first course and created lasting networks among the faculty and the students. I am more than thrilled that Wits University agreed to partner on this program. This has brought an important academic scrutiny and associated validation. While this is a certificate course, I'm hoping that this has helped to generate interest among the participants of the course to continue to further study regulatory science. What we really do need to start is a research or, or strengthen a research agenda to the work of regulators in Africa. I also hope that other universities of Crafts Africa will put more emphasis on an agenda of regulatory sciences into their under and postgraduate curriculum. Uh, finally, let me warmly thank the participants in this program. You were present, you were engaged, and you've provided an important baseline for this debut program. Uh, congratulations again, and good luck on the important work that you do to ensure safe, effective, and quality medicines for our people. Ada Alatoy Peppo, Amanda Nguengwe, Asari Yebowa, Bashiru Yusuf, Daniel Nti. Evelyn Zifamba, Francis Anuga, Grace Matimba,
Gumanzi, Isaac Menenzi. Harriet Pianco. Itekani Mabunda. Rato Makurani. Libet Chirinda. Lodi Moropa. Malebelo Maputeho Salikani Margaret Nakofa Malachi Molebocheng Ramati Nana Afrakoma Ashia Nana Yana Timoa Obiri Yeboa Makutula Edet Mayela Tombi Mtembu Nyasha Manchuji Pebi Rutendo Chatezvi Rambizai Manyeveri Rutendo Kadzungi Sasani Venus Chauke Sibungile Bagongo Tembelile Malongwe Victoria Malodi Sakiti Good morning, Professor Chinara respected faculty, administrators, family, and the graduating class of 2021. It is such an honor to be a part of this celebration, the first ever graduation ceremony for the competency course concerning dossier assessments for clinical assessors within African regulatory agencies here at the University of the Witwatersrand. It's such a pleasure to share in the celebration with such a unique cohort of graduates. Class of 2021, you graduate in a time when, I, when this course is still in its infancy, but at a time in our history where the world is dealing with enormous challenges, but at a time where these opportunities created by these challenges have never been greater. You are the class that is going to take the teachings provided to you in this course to new dimensions and create the backbone for clinical African clinical assessors that follow you. You are the future that will bring solutions to our regulatory environment, armed with the skills and knowledge that you've attained from some of the best minds in regulatory sciences. And with an eagerness, I hope, to pass it on to clinical assessors that follow after you. To the class of 2021, I wish to congratulate you once more and hope that we will see you again soon here at WITS as we continue to partner with international and African partners and members of the regulatory fields and training institutes to grow in our provision of regulatory science training and regulatory research. In closing, I wish to ask that the graduates please join me in a round of applause for the regulatory agencies that provided the immense support needed to make this course such a success and the faculty who helped you to reach this milestone. And then to those in the audience who are here to honor our graduates, please join me in saluting the class of 2021. Congratulations, class of 2021.
Thank you. We tried to give it a, a, a celebratory feel. Uh, once again, if we could just share a round of applause for our graduates, who many of them are joining us online. Thank you so much. Um, just to also say, um, you know, uh, we can uh, have discussions. Um, this will benefit those who have joined us virtually um, to post questions or comments on the chat. And also at some point we will come to a point where we open it up for questions uh, with those that have joined us here. So please do um, ask questions, post comments, etc. I'm now going to um, hand over to a dear friend, um, you know, someone who's really had um, African capacity building at the core of his heart. I knew about Colin Niven before I could meet him um, in engagements with Professor Kelly Chibale, and he had this fantastic training program and he had partnered uh, with Colin and his previous employer, and they were doing phenomenal work. And we see that same um, interest, that same drive, that same passion around capacity building really filtering um, even into the regulatory space. So I must say, Colin, thank you so much for the partnership. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure to work with you. And I look forward to what we can achieve together with yourselves, with our faculty, with the support from our sponsors. So over to you to facilitate the next session, please. So thanks, Jimmy. And I have to say, uh, feelings mutual. It's great to work with you guys. So uh, in a hybrid meeting, we need a face-to-face -face chair and a, and, a, and a virtual chair. I'd like to say that this was always planned that way, but <laughs> to quote myself, like everything in this pandemic, COVID decided that I should stay in Basel, but it, it's great to be with you. Let, let me just reiterate what, what Tumi said. I, I know a lot of you are on, online. Uh, please use the chat and start putting in your reactions, your, your comments. Thus far, we've sort of had one-way communication. So please, anything that sort of sparks your interest, uh, just put something into the chat. What we're going to move into next is a couple of uh, short talks. Um, we've got four individuals that are going to present to you, actually three, three individuals that's going to present, for you, present to you, and then we take a short break. Uh, so first up is uh, Eric, and Eric is going to talk to you virtually. I, I met Eric uh, through the short course that you just enjoyed the graduation ceremony on, and Eric was one of those stars that emerged. Uh, Eric is with the Ghana Food and Drug Administration. Uh, listen carefully. He talks fast, that's because his brain works very fast as well. Eric, over to you. Yeah, thank you, Colin. Please, um, would you share my slide? So why, why um, are we bring I... up Eric's slides, unless you want to show it to yourself, Eric? But I'm going to do the thing that I kept doing to you throughout the course. Uh, you were sitting against a very bright background, which means that we can't see uh, your lovely face. Not is is the design from the office. And this this is this is now a, a public joke between Eric and myself that's happened throughout the course that we ran recently. Yeah, I guess it's better. It's the design of the office. That's Light doesn't come in from the back, so unless I come this way. Thank okay. You. Eric, you're live. Great stuff. Yeah, so here we go. Um, <coughs> I'm just going to talk about the current status of regulatory skills, capacity, including the requirements at the, uh, at the food and drugs here in Ghana. Uh, I can see my slides. And um, the outline is about the introduction and the mandate of the Food and Drugs Authority, Ghana. Uh, Colin, I can still not see my slides. That's that's correct. And I, I guess our colleagues in the room are busy trying to project. Yes, let, if you can just give us a moment. I sent it to them. I didn't make provision. I didn't make yeah, it 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 it. Here. We're doing well in terms of time, Eric. Uh, we're, we're doing well in terms of time. Okay. We're waiting to come up with a good time. You should be able to see them now? 
Yes. Yeah, I can see. So can we go to the next slide, please? Yeah. And can we also go to to uh, full screen view to? Okay, so look, that's the outline. That's the introduction. The legal mandate of the Food and Drugs Authority, um, Ghana. Oh, please, can you come back? Yeah, uh -huh, okay. That's under the Health Product and Technologies and Technical Operational Divisions. This, uh, this is the directorate, or this is the division that is responsible for the regulation of um, um, pharmaceuticals, that's including both therapeutics and diagnostics. Then the Center for Laboratory Service and Research, that is responsible for testing of products. Then we'll talk about the current skill set and capacity important for regulation for maturity level three, which the authorities are at the moment now, then the way forward to maturity level four and, then, and as a world listed authority, then the conclusion. Can we go to the next slide, please? <clears throat> so the FDA was established in 1997 as a Food and Drugs Board. Then under a law, that's PNDC law 305B. This was revised in the year 2012 uh, that's now that's um, the current Public Health Act 851, 2012. I mean, we found out that the old law was not um, good enough with respect to the regulation of medical products, so it had to be amended. And as of now, it's still undergoing review to align with the, um, that's, uh, the African, the Afri um, the, that's the African Union model law. Yeah. So is there part six, seven, and eight of the public health act that regulates the activities of the Food and Drugs Authority? Next slide. So that's the vision. The vision is to protect health and safety of people in Ghana and be a global center of excellence for, for food and medical products regulation. And the mission is the FDA exists to ensure the safety, quality, and efficacy of human and veterinary drugs food, biological products, cosmetics, medical devices, household chemical substance, and clinical trials, and the control of tobacco products to the enforcement of re relevant standards to protect public health. So this covers the scopes of the uh, scope of products regulated by the authority. And then the core values, as you can see on, on my right side, is the integrity, accountability, and teamwork. Next slide. So under the Health Products and Technologies Division, the, these are the following directories that fall under it. Drug and herbal medicines, clinical trials and safety monitoring. But then under this, under clinical trials and safety monitoring, here we have the vaccines, biologics, and biosimilars. That department falls under here because, but because these products are not treated as generics and they almost have to, um, the dosages, the model five will always have to be completed because you either have um, and uh, some clinical data to a limited extent. So we don't regulate them under drugs and medicines, but we regulate them as a department under the clinical trials and safety monitoring directorate. Then we have the medical devices and cosmetics, and then tobacco and, and substances of abuse. But of course, food, I did not put food here because it doesn't fall under the scope of this. Next slide. Then for the technical operations directorates, that, that's we have the inspections and then that's the regulatory inspections and the enforcement department. Now they are responsible for licensing of premises and also ensuring compliance to CGMP. That's for the inspection, the regulatory inspections directorate. Then the enforcement, that's market surveillance force, and that is to ensure that products that are circulating on the market are of the right quality and will do good but not cause, uh, will not be a danger to public health. Next slide. And there's the Center for Laboratory Service and Research. That's, it has six testing laboratories. That's a drug physicochemical laboratory. That's where medicines, that's both small molecules and well characterized bi biologics are tested. The pharmaceutical microbiology department, that's sterility and the toxin and some microbial acids are also done. We have the cosmetics and household chemical substances laboratory, medical devices laboratory, the food physical chemical laboratory, and then the food microbiology laboratory. So these are the six testing laboratories of the authority. And they are all ISO 17025 accredited. And the drug physical chemical laboratory will soon be WTOP qualified. So what are the current skill set and capacity? Look, 
look at all the departments that you can have all the best department, have the best policies. If you don't have the human resource, nothing, we all know nothing will happen. So we know in the regulatory authority is the skills, the human, no, human resources is the pillar to everything. So <clears throat> the current skills, skills and capacity, the authority is effectively able to regulate the quality section of the common technical document, which is used by all uh, regulatory authority. That's the model three, for that's the drug substance and drug or small molecules and some type of vaccines, that's the traditional vaccines. Now there's, um, there's enough capacity to handle this, so that is in quite of a challenge. And even the authority is a regulatory center um, for, um, say it's a regional center for regulatory as, um, excellence as designated by the AU. So for here, there isn't much of a challenge. And then when it comes to bioequivalence, evaluation of bioequivalent protocol and report for generic drugs, there, there's a lot of capacity in-house, uh, which doesn't pose a challenge now. I mean, with both the clinical section and the bioanalytical section, there are people who have been trained to assess bioanalytical methods, back calculate, uh, take data from the applicants file, back calculate, and see if the, 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 the data put there is correct. I mean, the log, the log transformations and then the confidence intervals, those are handled easily. So. And this same scenario applies to cos cosmetics and household chemical substances, as class one and class two medical devices, tobacco and then substance of abuse. And also there's adequate capacity for the regulation for the conduct of clinical trials. Of course, for clinical trials, the FDA is also the regional center for regulatory excellence. Then there's effective regulation of tobacco and tobacco products. That place is more of legislation. So there isn't much there to talk about. And the testing of tobacco too is not, it's not, it's nothing quite difficult. <clears throat> then also when it comes to that um, operations uh, like compliance, there's adequate capacity to inspect manufacturing facility for small molecules, including sterile plants. And with, there's a robust post-market surveillance system in place based on the risk assessment. This tool was developed together by, um, with, together with the US, United States Pharmacopeia, their program that is uh, promoting the quality of medicines plus, uh, we call it the MedRS tool, and it's based on risk assessment. All the, so that we've moved away from the tra traditional way of doing um, market surveillance and then it's now based on risks, and this is a tool which the USP helped <clears throat> the authority develop. And then when it comes to pharmacovigilance, there's a robust pharmacovigilance system in place, and that is also, a, a, if you look from the GBT, that's, that, this system is at maturity level four. And as I said earlier, all the testing laboratories are ISO 17025-2017 accredited, and the drug physical chemical laboratory is likely to be pre-qualified within the next I would say a few weeks, but then here I put months because the last inspection was done in December last year, and uh, mostly um, the queries, that, the findings that were found were not, there wasn't nothing critical, so they've all been addressed, and I think we submitted to the WHO PQ team by the, by the 10th of next month. After this, we hopefully are uh, expecting a very positive result. And now what are the gaps? <coughs> When it comes to <clears throat> that's review you now, that's vaccines and well characterized biologists, including biosimilar applications. That's the model three, that's for quality, that's the drug substance and drug product, model four, the non-clinical, and then model five, that's the clinical section. Here we do have some capacity, but very limited. So we are now, um, as Colin said, we had 10 people trained, I mean, about eight, nine of them had a certificate. So this is an area we need to intensify and build our capacity to have enough people to do this job because as at now the critical mass here it's very very small touch with something happens it could be a problem so this is an area that we are looking out for and also there's lack of adequate capacity to assess class 3 and class 4 medical devices especially the ones that come into direct contact with human tissues and we are now trying to build capacity in the area of biocompatibility and electrophysiology of very um, class 3 and 4 devices and then when it comes to CGMP of vaccines and biologics manufacturing facilities in accordance with the WHO, EU, and the US FDA guidelines. Yeah, this is also a challenge. As I can say, we have about only two or three qualified inspectors who can handle these um, facilities with ease and very comfortable. But then we need to de-escalate it down to get a lot of people. Because as you know, for, when it comes to vaccine, you cannot just apply general GMP because it depends on the nature and type of vaccine. As Tumi said, we're used to the traditional vaccines 
wholesale inactivated or life attenuated. When it comes from that one to the recombinant, the RNA, RNA and then the vector ones, you can see that the technologies are totally different. And you need to understand the process and then the product before you can conduct inspections in these facilities. And also how to inspect these class three and four medical devices, manufacturing facilities. That's also a gap that the authority has, had, um, has identified and we are putting in mechanisms to address that. And then review of clinical study, that's a clinical study report that's in accordance with the ICH E3. Yeah, we've started training to build more capacity because as of now, we cannot count more than three senior assessors who can handle this thing confidently. And there are about over 23 people in the department. So that tells you that there's a lot of work to do. Then when it comes to testing of vaccines, most likely by the end of 2023, Ghana is going to become a last um, that's um, vaccine manufacturing country, but then it will fail and no, that's failing and labeling. Uh, the bulk, the formulated bulk will come in and uh, there um, the are two companies that are always on their way to fail. And these vaccines will have to be released locally. So naturally, the, the authority would have to build capacity to test this vaccine. But for the physical chemical, most of the physical chemical tests, those are under control because they are in the scope of the drug physical chemical. And then when it comes to the microbiology, endotoxins, and then uh, sterility is also within the scope. But then when it comes to that cell line, that potency assays based on cell line and bioassays, that's a challenge there. That's a gap that we have seen and we have identified an institute in Holland, um, the Netherlands, where they can offer training. And we are almost in the process of sending about four people for training. That's both in the potency and bioassays and then formulation and the GMP aspect. Can we go to the next slide? Can we go to the next slide, please? Next slide. I, I think that should be the last slide. So that's why what I can say now in conclusion, I mean, the, you know, the FDA can acknowledge the fact that competent and skilled personnel is a key requirement for it to successfully execute its mandate of protecting public health as enshrined in the act that governs the regulation of products under its mandate, which I said as an Act 851-2000. And the authority continues to put in the necessary strategy to build the skills and competency of its staff to help achieve executive mandate properly, uh, no, effectively. And also to move it towards maturity level four and finally as a world listed authority. Is the chair over? Eric, as usual, you did not disappoint. Thank you very much. A, a rapid fire presentation. I particularly loved your gap slide because you know one of the goals of this session is really to put our hands out and say, who's going to help us fill those gaps in terms of helping us put the capacity together? Uh, to me, if you could help me face to face locally, if somebody has a burning question there, let's get at least one question locally and one question virtually just to get the conversation going, and then we'll move to the next talk. Yeah, there's a question over there. So we, we'll, we'll keep it short, Burn, so we get to your talk, but let's just get some talk from the audience. <laughs> there's one over there and one there. OK, thank you very much. And it is nice listening to Eric as usual. Eric, I was just looking at uh, when we are trying to build the capacity, which we know is fairly limited in terms of even the facilities or the institutions that can provide you with the framework of the persons you need. Uh, how long do you see this being a regional approach rather than a country approach? Because I don't think any African country is going to, as a regulator, is going to have all these competencies within the country. How do you see having a regional approach? being the best way out, either through ECOWAS, um, ECC, SADC. I agree with you totally. The original approach is always the best because I'm um, like here, you can do the best if your neighbors are not doing well. I mean, you know, we have porous borders and you might end up, end up getting products that you have no license, but you still find it on your market. So uh, we have always believed in the original approach. And as you can see, when it comes to the ECOWAS, we play a very big role in the ECOWAS region, especially building capacity in the regulation of biologics and then vaccines. 
So I agree the best way to go is the original approach. Because as of now, most of the, look, we have about 54 or 55 countries. I don't know which one is political, politically correct, but we only, as of now, we have only two ML3. And I think more are yet to come. So that should tell you that the best way for us to go is the regional approach and not country-wise. But then from the regional, it has to start from the country, then it feeds into the block, the regional block, and then finally the whole continent under armor. So, so, so thanks, thanks very much, uh, Professor Ogutu. It, it's good to see that you're in the audience there, and I recognize your voice even though you're off camera. So, so and Bernard, Colin, there is another question from from the all, from the hall here. Okay. okay. Um. Good afternoon. Hi, Colin. It's Rose. <laughs> um. Good afternoon, Eric. My name is Rose Hayeshi. I'm the director of the preclinical drug development platform at Northwest University. So I don't have a regulatory background. I'm a scientist, but um, given my role currently, I'm starting to um yeah get involved in the regulatory aspects in terms of non-clinical. And my question is, what is the cause behind the gaps? Is it um, that they don't have the scientific background? And to follow on from that, the nature of the training they will receive in, I think you said it was Denmark, what, what will they be training in terms of the assays or in terms of looking at data from the assays? What is the nature of the training? Thanks. Okay. So no, the first question, like when I said, okay, now I will steer towards your um, which is the model for the non-clinical. Previously, almost everything that we were handling on the continent had been generics. And like when it came to new chemical entities, we were always based on reliance, even without thinking of how the data would be extrapolated. So yeah, we didn't pay much attention. But when we started regulating clinical trials, then we found out that there was the need to build capacity in the non-clinical area. And that is being done, but um, as I can say, when I, it comes to this authority, like in Ghana, I might say, you will not get more than two people doing that. that, that, that no, you, you will not get more than two people doing that. And then when it comes to the training, the second part of your question, that is the training. Yeah, the training that we, are, we identified too, the, for the people in the laboratory, is going to be hands-on. It's going to be hands-on. And then like the other parts, that's the GMP one, is also going to be hands-on. But these are people, when it comes to the knowledge, as you are saying, we, as a, as a requirement in this authority, we only rec regulate people with the requisite size background who can be trained. So that one, there's no, the basic knowledge, it is, the basic knowledge is there. It's up to the authority to give them the relevant training and the training we always believe in. It being hands on, not always a classroom uh, like you know, showing slides and workshop approach. That is why we've identified this since you that's for, in the Netherlands for hands on training, but that is for inspectors that's for inspectors and then the laboratory staff. But when it comes to non-clinical, we are yet, um, no, no, there's an in-house training program with us with respect to the, um, the ICH S1 to 11 series and then uh, M3, R, no, M3 R2, which we're trying to train people, but then later we might think of sending people outside when they need a right. Over. Eric, thank you so much. Rose, thanks for the question. I'm, I'm gonna say let's, let's close the immediate uh, questions now. Eric, I hope you, you stay around because we hope we can get a little bit more of a conversation closer to the end. Uh, but let's now move okay. to Professor... Very good. Thank you, Eric. Uh, let's now right. move to Professor Bernd Rosenkrantz, uh, a good friend, uh, spent a lot of his time in, in uh, South Africa as, as head of pharmacology at, at the University of Stellenbosch and is now part of the local organizing committee for the main meeting. Uh, Bernd, why don't you take us through your presentation now? Yeah, Colin, thank you very much for that kind introduction. And what I'm going to do is give you a bit more background on that uh, pilot course that we have been doing. And as a background information to this, just to recap what is um, competencies, what are we looking at when we are training competent professionals, then that includes the competencies um, knowledge, which is provided by accredited courses and skills, the workplace training, we heard about that, there's a need for this. And number three is, um, I think, also very important, and that is correct attitudes, 
um, and that can be should be supported by proper mentoring at the workplace. And these are the three elements um, that should also be considered for establishing of the program that we're talking about. And when we do that, um, first step is to set, set the standards, um, discuss and agree on our outcomes of these programs, such a program, syllabus, um, a detailed curriculum, and finally, which modules um, to set up. And then it comes to the implementation phase, and that's where we have been now with our pilot program, set up a course, um, set up training centers, and that can be also virtual, and proper recognition or accreditation. Um, Tumi has already mentioned our workshop in June 2020, where we discussed about the vision, about the strategy, what we wanted to do, um, and finally came up with a proposal to start up with a specific product, which is a pilot course, a pilot module that we have been talking about. And for all of you who are interested in what we have been discussing, that has also been published, and the reference to the publication is provided here, and I would like to um, suggest that any one of you who is really interested um, also reads that. Um, one as important aspect on, of that competency framework that we have been discussing is shown in this slide and that is taken from the publication. And that is that we have different competency levels in the end of the trainees. It's not just uh, People don't know anything and then of course and then they know everything but it's building up so it's lifelong learning. Um, and that is linked to certain accreditation and um, certification requirements. So the core modules, that was the knowledge, subject matter experience, that is um, the, the skills, work outputs, um, so that one actually sees that something comes out. And then levels two, three and four is just adding more and more and more to that. Um, and that um, should be linked to a career path that motivates the people in the end to participate in these programs um, and the names of the career pathway um, may be different in different regulatory agencies. So these are just four examples that are provided here. Our program that um, where we have seen where we have seen already the graduation ceremony. So we have seen that that was successful. Um, on talent building of specialists in medicines regulation in Africa was a short course, what we call a primer for clinical assessors within ref African regulatory agencies. And it was largely in a nutshell about clinical data in regulatory submissions. And the specific objectives and um, goals, teaching goals um, of that individual one course was a uh, talk about and learn about generation of clinical safety or efficacy data, clinical trial organization, how are the clinical trials organized, different roles of clinical data from exploratory versus confirmatory studies, different types of clinical data, validation requirements, the differences between clinical and statistical significance, so we talked a lot about also statistics. And finally, make the link to the regulatory submission and uh, regulatory output, and that is the product information um, impact of, of the clinical safety and efficacy data on these. And we structured it in a way um, that we called it, um, gave it different names, the different phases, three phases of the course. So the first one was the building of the regulatory dossier. How um, does the sponsor um, actually do that? And that is the construction phase. Then we had the regulatory assessment of the dossier, which is deconstruction phase, which means putting it all into pieces but the pieces shouldn't be stay as pieces, but they need to be reconstructed. So that's number three. And that is then how does the dossier actually support the marketing authorization product information. The course plan was, um, as we already have heard, um, a collaborative effort with academics, various academics from local, local universities, from international institutions, and the regulatory agencies, the three that we already heard about, SAPRA, Ghana, FDA, and MCAS. We had 39 initially registered students. Um, we had a core team of people who are listed here. Um, we know about, heard about the accreditation by the University of uh, Witwatersrand, Witz University, which is really great that we got that. Um, the um, 
the course was um, on a level of five ECTS, which is the European system, um, credit system or uh, corresponding to 14 South African credits. And what we had, and we heard of that already from uh, David before, there is a need for monitoring and evaluation what you are doing um, and not just do a course and then no one knows what the outcome is. Um, so at the moment, and it's still ongoing, is a formal independent, that's important, monitoring and evaluation by um, Ivana, who is mentioned here. Um, so that's um, a key element of that program is, as well. So for us, it's very important. It's a fully virtual course, which makes it possible that three agencies across the continent actually um, participating. The 12 weekly lessons I've already mentioned. And each of the lessons was run by an individual lesson leader, such as Eric, whom you have seen, and many others. Um, with a couple of co-leaders and supported by one of the core team members. There was one weekly contact session, so the students had actually to spend two hours per week and that's it and the rest of the time they could do on their own time but that was prescribed of course including some guest lectures and there were student tasks and presentations there was group work and we'll come back to that in a minute and a final exam um, before go instead of going through all the 12 weeks i've just show you a few of the um, photos um, of those who have been involved in this pro in this program and the group work is group leaders I mentioned here um, that, that was a student self-study program with group presentations, plenary discussions. Um, the group work was as much as possible integrated in, week, in the weekly sessions. Um, and the aims of the group of that specific group work was, um, to, to discuss and um, uh, conclude on preparation of regulatory assessment reports for four different products, and these are those that are mentioned here, um, to compare the different assessment reports for the different products and compare for each product between the different between African region and non-African regions. What are the differences? So that was, in a nutshell, what the group work was about. That's how the Moodle uh, learning platform looked like. It's a busy slide, but it just um, is meant to show you how, on the right side, how the platform was constructed. And you see in the middle all the different weeks. Um, and each week had, um, had their own platform that has been developed together with the weekly leader. It was very interactive, included presentation slides, videos, contact sessions, recordings, reading materials, student tasks forum posts and with the reference to the group work. On the student tasks, I would like to mention specifically that we requested students to talk about and reflect on their own work and not only um, what they have read up. Student assessments, um, 30, and these were those who where we have seen the names um, earlier, 30 of the 39 students actually concluded um, the, uh, the course successfully. Um, the, those who were, did not conclude successfully actually were those who actually didn't participate in the MCQ. So that was participation was then pretty successful. Um, and so that the assessment was based on the self-study task completion, on the group work, on the attendance of the live tutorials and the MCQ. What are the next steps? And that's something also an element that we need to discuss, should discuss now here, um, is number one, we have are in the process of adaptation that module again, was based on what we have learned um, and repeated by middle of this year. Um, and then also include, and that's what the need, team needs to decide um, on in these details, additional African regulatory agencies. Uh, number two, I mentioned the mentorship program that needs to be de developed much more, more in detail um, to support the workplace experiential learning. And number three is now to prepare additional modules so to expand the program. And with the acknowledgements, I would like to finish um, and would like to specifically acknowledge the whole program management team um, from the three regulatory agencies, all the other team members, 
um, the dedicated course leaders and the, all the lecturers, the financial support by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the MCAS R core EDCTP regulatory science project. And finally, the University of Witwatersrand Rand for the accreditation, but also the active uh, contribution and participation in the program. And all of you would like to thank for the interest in this talk. Timmy, if you could help me again, if, if there's a, a question, at least one from the from the live audience. Yeah, there is one. A small technical mi microphone issue, but that is solved. Yeah, um, thank you. Um, my name is Akenedi Otombe. I'm a statistician at VETS, and um, I was lucky to be part of this group. Uh, one of the things I wondered, and I've um, seen you uh, talk about it in passing, is, you know, the course was interesting. We had, you know, a couple of regulatory authorities represented in the in the course, but it'd be I just wondered whether you know what plans we have in place or we can discuss to put in place so that um, we expand the the reach uh, because when we did this map out you know looking at the distribution of participants from across the continent um, I think we could do more to reach wider and then we get more people but I mean because it was a start I thought it was a, it was a successful program thank you yeah, just a comment on this. Um, absolutely, you are right. Um, and we just specifically decided to start with three agencies and not many more, um, so that um, that it was easy just for us, easier as a pilot. Um, but the next step has to be I'm fully uh, with you, um, then to expand it to other African countries. And actually, when I first discussed that uh, with Tumi in January 2020, um, her first response was, it's not only Sapra, but all across Africa. Um, and um, that will be the way, has to be the way to go. And the second is, but I had that in my slide, is expand also with the content. So it's not just only clinical data and regulatory submissions, but it could be statistics, it could be CMC, it could be whatever, pharmacovigilance and many other topics. Great stuff, but I'm going to pull one from from the from the live from the virtual audience. Uh, Steve, I'm going to pounce on you. You 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 bring an interesting perspective on the on the different other disciplines. So I, I don't know if you have the ability to unmute yourself, Steve, and just comment or ask a question. Steve Kern. Ah, there you go. Okay, now I'm unmuted. So, uh, thanks, Colin. So, yeah, a question I was wondering, and I think it's it's great. Um, so, thanks to me and Colin for answering on your first class and recognizing this is a pilot. So, you want to start where you have success um, to build on um, the capabilities of people who are already working in regulatory agencies. But is it potential to use these kinds of courses as a way to bring others into the regulatory field? And so there I had outlined people from pharmacology, so students coming right out of a pharmacology training or a pharmacy training at WITS or at another university or even engineering uh, or chemistry, um, you know, that might have the right technical background and training that could then be used as a way to pipeline people, if you will, into regulatory authorities in the future and whether that might be an option for some of the training courses themselves. Over. If Thanks, I Stephen. can answer that, um, that uh, that is um, absolutely in line with with what um, we are thinking, or we need to discuss that with the team. Um, but I think one should not um, work to work in silos. Um, and the other option then is also then once the course is more up and running, um, also include pharmaceutical industry in this. But that um, needs to be discussed and agreed and take it forward. So one step at a time. 
But as, um, yeah, as trainers, I, I think it is excellent, an excellent idea also to think about, um, um, like you said, engineers or someone out of, out of the field who can also contribute if, uh, if they can contribute. Yeah, that's a biased perspective since I'm an engineer myself. But, uh, so, but I, you know, welcome I, to but I appreciate the Eric's comment that, you know, as, as an ML3 regulator in Ghana, right, that he mentioned that he only has two or three senior people who can, can you know, carry out a very critical function. So, you know, while they have then the coverage, which is great in terms of being able to do all the things, they don't have a lot of depth in the bench, so to speak, right? And that would be helpful to think about how do we help reinforce both the breadth and the depth over time. Thank you. So I see Blanche, you you getting somebody else there? Yeah, it, um, it's to me. Um, I must say, I think I'm a test case of exactly that scenario, right? Because I come from an R&D background and I'm now with the regulator. But I mean, I must say it 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 is what I found even engaging with um, our assessors who are largely in the R&D environment is the, the innovation, the different way of seeing um, a regulatory pathway, um, you know, is very refreshing. I have lots of debates with Posha, who's my colleague, our chief regulatory officer, and she's been with the regulator long, and we partner well because she puts me in line to say, but this is what a regulator should do, and I challenge things. So I think that mix is, is, is quite a good one, and certainly we should do a lot more of that. So thanks, Tony. I'm, I'm going to pull one more from, from the virtual audience, mainly because Bernd actually gave the hint for it. So Amita, you've asked a couple of questions. Um, I wonder whether I can bring you online. So this is Amita Joshi from Genentech Roche in the US. Again, thank you for joining us. You want to mm -hmm. vocalize your comment? Yes, yes. Um, I was, my question was regarding, you know, how do regulators in the various different African countries collaborate together when they're doing reviews? Is there um, strength in sort of doing this together? That was my first question. And the second question is, in the next steps a slide, you mentioned that you would like to develop mentorship programs to support um, workplace experiential learning. And I wonder whether this you expect um, only among regulators or would a pharmaceutical company participate in something like this? Um, so those are my two questions. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Amita. So, so let, let's keep the first question for later mm -hmm. on for a broader discussion. Yeah, regarding the second question, um, on on the mentorship uh, program, um, absolutely. Um, one of one of the possibilities also could then be um, also to to move uh, people, but that is that is a bit pie in the sky. But like with the FDA, what the FDA is doing, move people back and forth between industry and um, the re regulator. Um, but that all is uh, needs to be discussed in detail and how that could work and all that. Um, but I think the sky is the limit and one can should think a bit also out of the box and uh, what actually are the possibilities and what one could do and should do. Um, absolutely, the mentorship program, um, um, definitely like in industry, the, uh, there are lots of experienced people who could do that. Um, but that would be then the next step. Thank you. Yes. We'll Very follow. good. So with that, with that, thanks, Amita, and and good to see you uh, again. So so with that, let's let's go now to 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 Margaret, uh, our next talk. Uh, so Margaret, I'm not sure whether you're going to project your slides on your own, or if you have slides, or whether it's going to be done from the podium there. Um, I do. I did see you in the audience already. Uh, we've spoken many times, and I'm, I'm, I was thrilled to read through your CV and see that both of us have a common background in terms of both being pharmacists. Uh, Margaret is really, really exp an experienced regulator and uh, is with the African Union Development Agency, NEPAD. Uh, Margaret, are you online? Can you unmute? Yes, I'm online. Perfect. And, and, and you can take it over. All right. No, thank you. Thank you very much, Colin, and uh, thank everyone, Sapra, for hosting this uh, debate and uh, all the partners that are, are responsible for organizing this event. As uh, Colin said, my name is Margaret Domando Segonda. I work for the African Union Development Agency. Uh, and so I'm happy to be here. 
to really share the experience uh, that we have uh, in terms of really uh, building regulatory capacity on the continent. And uh, my plan is to share with you the concept that we had uh, started way back in 2014. Can you see my, my screen? Not yet. Not yet. At least mm -hmm. I can't, yes, just yet. Let's just give it a minute or two. Maybe the technical colleague in the, in the room might be able to help. Uh, the technical colleague is working on it. You don't have that. You cannot see my screen. Yeah, so you should be sharing from your slide and it's coming up now. I, I'm actually sharing, so that's the reason why I'm asking. Yeah, we can see it. And and I can see you it can virtually see as well. So I'm assuming that the virtual audience can see it as well. Thanks, Margaret. Please proceed. All right, thank you. So essentially what I'm trying to do here is to share with you uh, the work that we've done so far in terms of designating regional centers of regulatory excellence, but also the body of knowledge that was built in order to support uh, that program. And, and so, um, so I'll give you a background on where we've come from with the regional centers of regulatory excellence. And also I'll speak to the body of knowledge that was developed to support the African Medicines Regulatory Professional Fellowship Program. And, 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 and then also share with you the, uh, the evaluation of the article that was conducted uh, sometime in 2019-2020. Now, as a way of background, um, so it was in 2014 when we undertook to convene um, a roundtable discussion bringing together the partners that uh, were conducting uh, different regulatory training programs on the continent. And the reason of convening that round the effort because we had a situation where there was a, a lot of, you know, training programs, short term, you know, programs one week, like on GMP training in a hotel, this, and another one for product evaluation and registration in another hotel. And, and so it wasn't well coordinated and uh, we, we realized that we needed to really have a system that would ensure that we embed whatever training programs that are there in, in existing institutions to ensure that uh, there is long-term sustainability. So we agreed to establish a regulatory capacity development technical committee to really look into how we could uh, designate uh, centers of excellence in the different regulatory fields. And so we eventually came up with the uh, framework. And essentially, the, what, the, the idea was to establish a uh, designate these centers uh, as the partnership between the regulatory agency, the academic institution, and or the research institution. Uh, with the capability of, uh, you know, uh, specific regulatory science expertise, as well as uh, training capabilities uh, using the existing uh, academic institution. And uh, so the initiative was established by the um, ADA NEPAD under the MRS initiative to fill that, the gap that was inherent um, on the continent and to also address the challenges I mentioned before of uh, uncoordinated uh, regulatory training program. Uh, but of course, the idea was to also increase the regulatory workforce on the continent. And so, uh, if you look at this slide, uh, on the left-hand side, it speaks to um, the role of the ARCOS. Essentially, it provides academic and technical training in regulatory science, applicable to different regulatory functions and management aspects but also to contribute to skills enhancement through hands-on training and training program, but also uh, we uh, embrace exchange programs amongst the NRA. The articles were also meant to encourage practical training through placement of pharmacists pharmacy, uh, to pharmaceutical industry, but also to conduct operational research uh, pilot test innovations and interventions to inform best practice for scale-up to other regulatory agencies. And the process was such that 
we developed, uh, we actually agreed on a criteria, uh, how an article should look like, and then there was a process for application. Um, it, 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 we actually had to publish uh, uh, an expression of interest, uh, you know, uh, for all the interested uh, players, and then through that, then we would conduct an assessment to determine whether they meet the criteria, a selection was conducted, and then eventually the articles were designated. So we had 11 uh, centers designated in 2014. And this slide fits the existing regional centers of regulatory excellence. We have two that are focusing on pharmacovigilance, one in Ghana and another one in Kenya. We have articles that are focusing training and core regulatory functions. Uh, we have uh, one in Tanzania and another one in Nigeria. This is uh, Nigeria at the University of Ibadan, uh, which is the Center for Drug Discovery, Development, and, product, uh, 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 and Production. But also, we have had uh, designated quality assurance and quality control uh, articles. This is the Northwest University at the uh, University of Portstrom but also the National uh, Agency for Food and Drug uh, Administration in Nasdaq, Nigeria. And uh, we have also articles on medicine registration and evaluation, one in uh, MCAZ, uh, but of course, it's also uh, focusing on quality control as well. But also we have another one on medicine evaluation and registration in Tanzania School of Pharmacy, Muhimbili um, University of Health Sciences in, uh, in collaboration with the Tanzania Food and Drugs Authority. And then and we have, of course, uh, Eric mentioned about the Regional Center of Regulatory Excellence on Clinical Trial Oversight, but also on registration and evaluation, uh, which is a partnership between the Food and Drugs Authority of Ghana and the university there. And also we have um, another one in now, uh, Ouagadougou. This is a partnership between the uh, University of Ouagadougou uh, and the um, the, pharmacy, the Directorate of Pharmacy, which is a regulator for Burkina Faso, and this is focusing on clinical trial oversight. And uh, the last one is, of course, the Ugandan one, which is focusing on licensing, import and export, inspection, and so forth. So these are the regional centers that were designated then. And what we did, as I mentioned before, we had to come up with a body of knowledge, uh, which really is a technical content for instruction in the technical categories and areas that the articles could uh, be involved in capacity building. It is intended actually to serve two main purposes. One, to serve as a reference source for regulatory curricula reforms undertaken by the articles, but also to serve as a tool for harmonizing training curricula offered by various institutions. The body of knowledge is also intended to be utilized in the context of implementing proposed African Medicines Regulatory Professional Scholarship Program that was planned to be undertaken then. But uh, of course, unfortunately, we didn't pursue uh, that component of um, uh, regulatory professional scholarship program. And it is divided into three levels. One is the foundation level where the trainees acquire just basic knowledge in the key areas of medicine regulation. And the two is the specialization level, where which enables one to um, ensure that the trainees, they acquire the necessary theoretical grounding and practical exposure in the area of that specialization. And then the third level is advanced level, where, a, where uh, the, the candidate will demonstrate competencies in uh, analyzing, evaluating, applying their knowledge and skills in laboratory decision making as well as creating structures and systems for effective management of regulatory systems. And the idea was that um, this body of knowledge will eventually be aligned with the WHO Global Competency Framework for the data once it is. And in terms of uh, the achievements in this uh, process, uh, we uh, Based on the evaluation that was conducted by the uh, USID funded MTAP program, we have seen that uh, you know there's a lot of uh, uh, achievement in terms of the work that has been done in these articles. One is that uh, a number of uh, curricula have been developed, 
approximately 25 relating to regulatory system strengthening, but also uh, training had been uh, conducted at least more than 360 pharmaceutical and medical personnel across the continent have actually benefited from the training program. And I'll give you just two examples uh, in last with that. Uh, for the Ghana Food and Drugs Authority, for instance, who serves as uh, an article on clinical trial oversight, they have trained 54 regulatory experts from nine countries across the continent. In Kenya, the article on pharmacovigilance has been able to conduct training on TV and marketing surveillance, but also they've done some training, training, uh, training programs, uh, like short, you know, short uh, sort of, uh, training programs for two days, uh, and they've been able to train more than 4,000 health workers during the review period. But also, I think it's also a surprise to say here that in addition to the training programs, the articles have also been very instrumental in supporting the harmonization initiatives that are being undertaken across the region. For instance, in the West Africa, uh, East African community, the IGAD and Sadiq region. And also, we've seen also that the, uh, technical, uh, the articles have also provi uh, pro provided technical assistance to non articles regulatory authorities. For instance, the Ghana Food and Drug Authority was able to assist BIDE in reviewing the Ebola treatment protocol in West Africa during the Ebola uh, crisis. But also, we've seen an increased uh, visibility of articles globally, attracting technical partners. For instance, IAVI has been able to, uh, has actually come uh, on board to also support the, you know, the uh, programs in, in Ghana. We've also seen UNIDO also providing support, and also, as well as the Paul Erich Institute, among others. So essentially, this is what I want to share with you to say uh, we have a number of uh, training programs uh, across the continent, and I think the, the idea here is to see uh, how best can we ensure that these uh, programs are sustainable, but also we need really get to a point where we could now go to a point of building really um, regulatory professionals in, in, in a structured manner so that we are able to determine uh, the impact and also the, 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 the number increasing of the regulatory uh, experts across the continent. So that's what I wanted to share with you in terms of the work that we are doing uh, for, uh, uh, for this session. And I'm, I'm open for if there are any questions. Thank you so much for your attention. Thanks very much, Margaret. I think we may have had some issues with the slides as we went through, but, uh, but, but, but nevertheless, you came across really well. Let me ask uh, Tumi if she could help me take over now and uh, field questions here, Tumi. Thank you, um, Colin. In the interest of time, I hope it's okay that we um, go into the next session um, just to allow us time um, towards the end to then have um, uh, a conversation and have more qu time for questions and answers, um, if that's okay, please. So I'm going to ask that we move into the next session, section ses session 4.3 wherein we're getting feedback from our candidates and all three of them um, have joined us virtually. So we'll start with Ndombi um, Tembu from Sapra, uh, Mrs. Uh, Ada Alote from the Ghana, from Ghana FDA and Ms. Uh, Rutendo Kadzunge from MCAS Inzim. Thank you. Over to the three of you. Um, good day to everyone. Um, I'm Ndombi Mtembu from SAPRA, and I will be taking you through some of the experiences from the uh, our participation in the clinical assessors course. Um, should I project my slides? How are you going to be projecting? You may go ahead and project. Okay. Okay. Um. So the course provided a broad knowledge and understanding 
of the regulation and regulatory requirements for the review of medicines and the competence to apply them in practice. Um, it was conducted over 12 weeks and we had to attend integrative tutorials um, that were provided once a week on a Wednesday over two hours. We also had to um, commit to at least 10 hours of self-study per week and the course applied innovative and other modern methods of learning such as quizzes, group work and um, case studies and uh, eventually um, the administration of an exam at the end of the course. Um, aspects such as clinical data collection, interpretation and reporting were covered and also um, critical review for safety and efficacy including validity amongst others. Um, but um, as indicated uh, by the previous uh, speaker as well, is the course focused not only on the aspects of regulatory review, but rather on the entire process of the development and regulation of medicines. Um, there was an overview of the drug um, research and development uh, process and uh, all the way to the marketing authorization application from the perspective of both the applicant and the regulator. And an important key aspect that was observed from the course is the constant engagement of the sponsor and with the regulator when novel um, drug medicines are planned. The course then closed off with presentations from speakers practicing regulation and those in the pharmaceutical industry regarding the role that regulators and sponsors have as partners um, for patient benefit. And in the presentations, um, topics such as uh, WHO regulatory collaboration, examining the use of real world um, evidence in the regulatory process, strengthening of pharmaceutical innovation in Africa, and how better regulation of medicines would result in stronger regional health security were also covered. The impact that we've seen this have um, on SAPRA, of course, it has um, added on to um, the SAPRA's objectives for building competency for the in-house assessment of new chemical entities. But it has also provided knowledge on how to leverage on reviews conducted by recognized regulatory authorities whilst bearing in mind our local epidemiology. Um, we have seen uh, it has built confidence by closing some of the knowledge gaps that uh, some of the in-house assessors had, for example, with assessing the validity and acceptability of clinical data from these reports from RRAs. And we've seen some of our reviewers have taken the initiative to assess and review um, applications with clinical data, such as um, type 2 variations and um, uh, new chemical entity responses. And it has also um, enabled internal assessors that are in team leader roles to reduce the number of queries that arise from reports. Another thing that it has resulted in is it has resulted in a review of um, the questions that we actually pose to applicants. We actually take time now to actually review some of the questions that we pose to applicants from uh, following a review um, as to whether the applicants will be able to provide certain data or whether the report that we have in front of us would actually be sub uh, sufficient for the local epidemiology. Um, from the training, the members of the faculty um, demonstrated an in-depth knowledge on the course context and they encouraged interaction and discussion during the tutorials. The tutorials were very well planned and very interactive. Um, we received polls even um, during the tutorials where we would answer questions and um, and then we would get an answer to the poll um, during the tutorial. So they, they kept us engaged. Um, the resources were ready available on the Moodle platform. Um, the the self-study material was available about a week prior to the tutorial presentation and uh, following the tutorial presentation on that day a recording of the presentation would be available. As indicated before um, the, it was held virtually and we also still have access to the model platform. So if we want to go back and um, review some of the, the learnings, uh, we can actually go back in and um, onto the model platform and do that. Um, with regards to the group assignments, um, we were distributed into groups and each group was allocated a molecule to review. Um, some groups received an antimalarial pyromax, some received uh, betacholine for TB, and others received a biosimilar, either an insulin or infliximab. 
And this provided um, the opportunity to put into practice the learnings. And um, the groups had to conduct their own assessment of regulatory reviews um, that were conducted by um, the two um, regulatory agencies with which we align ourselves. And this was the EU and um, the FDA. And it uh, provided an opportunity to apply reliance to the local epidemiology and also provided an opportunity for the sharing of information between the participating um, national regulatory authorities. Um, we could not really fault uh, the, the, the course. It was very well structured, uh, but we do like a challenge. So we felt that um, the selection of um, dossiers that are not yet re registered in the SADC region, um, it would be of benefit if we could have such dossiers uh, for the group assignments. Um, we felt that some of the information um, regarding the molecules that were selected for us was already known. Um, and also um, with regards to to the reports that we were reviewing themselves, um, we would lo have loved to have a um, a full to conduct a full review and then maybe move on to um, assessing now a public assessment report from another agency. And then with regards to the group assignments, there were some technical uh, technological challenges, but um, the members of the faculty were always available to assist. Um, so with regards to the module platform, it did allow for interaction between the groups, but it didn't allow for verbal interaction. And it seemed that's what most of the groups preferred. So we ended up um, interacting on other platforms such as Teams and Zoom and WhatsApp. And also with regards to the group assignments, the platform did not allow for the upload of group presentations that would enable real-time updates of the presentation instead of having a person um, collate the presentation. But um, on consultation with uh, the faculty, again, um, Google Drive was suggested that that became the preferred platform for um, uploading our uh, presentations for the group assignments. Um, in conclusion, we felt the course was relevant. It provided um, the knowledge required in regulatory review and it provided even more new knowledge. And we would like to thank all the partners, the faculty members and the guest speakers who were involved in this initiative. Thank you. Thank you. And we will then take the next presenter. Mrs. Ada Alate from um, Ghana FDA. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Ada Alate with the Ghana FDA. Uh, can you kindly share the presentation for me? Certainly we'll do so. Thank you. The next slide, please. Hello, the next slide, please. Thank you. So uh, with the Ghana FDA, uh, we were supposed to comment about the impact of the training on the FDA after we completed the course in October. The FDA was lucky to have about 10 participants for this training program. And so we looked at it from the structural impact, the knowledge apart and networking that uh, we've involved ourselves in after the training. Next slide, please. On the structural impact, uh, the main thing that has, uh, the main impact we've had from the training is that most of the people that participated in the training have more or less been involved in primary assessment of clinical data. Previously, we had a system in place where we used to refer the clinical data from the marketing authorizations department to the clinical trials department. 
but currently we are doing that together. And so we are sharing information between these two departments in the assessment of applications that have are received. And also to support that, we've been able to develop an assessment tool. Uh, during the training, we realized that most of us did not have an assessment tool for assessing clinical data. We've developed one yet to be approved for us to use to ensure consistency in the assessment data uh, formats that we have. We've also looked at, uh, during the COVID era, we were receiving quite a number of applications and uh, we noted that the data that was submitted was not really in any specific format. So we are currently reviewing for adoption a guideline for the submission of clinical data for applications intended for treatment or prevention of COVID-19 infections by uh, the marketing authorization department. And then one key thing that we have really felt the impact has been the role of our in-house mentor. Uh, after the training, he has been with us. He's been very supportive, and that is in the person of Mr. Erika Karibuati. And uh, he's always been with us, but when we realized that he was a mentor during the training program, we've been engaging him a lot. Uh, anytime we have challenges, he's readily available. So I, I believe that when we continue with this mentorship program, we would actually benefit from this training more because they, they are there to support us in everything that we do. He actually reviews our work that we do and make the necessary comments and necessary input where necessary. So we are very appreciative of that and we thank him a lot for the effort and time he's put into us after the training. Next slide, please. On the issue of knowledge acquired, based on the knowledge we acquired through the training program, we have had an increase in the number of primary assessors for clinical aspects of marketing authorization applications received. And not all of us are actively involved, but most of us who participated in the training are currently actively involved in these uh, assessment process. And uh, it came to bear during the use of emergency use authorizations for some applications we received for the COVID-19 applications. And because we had quite a number to do the initial review, we realized that we were able to meet timelines for these applications when they were submitted because we kind of had a pool of primary assessors with support from the mentor that we had on site and some of our senior assessors who were guiding us. So uh, our timelines for emergency use authorizations were spot on. We were meeting our timelines based on the fact that some of us had been fortunate enough to have had some form of basic training for clinical review. And then we also utilized the risk benefit approach in granting marketing authorizations for those that could uh, that qualified to be issued with an approval. Uh, we got all these concepts through the training, and so we're doing minimal review of applications which had already been approved by World Resource NMRA, so we didn't need to do the whole thing. And so it was very beneficial that we put in these measures in place. And then one key thing that we learned from the training, which we really saw uh, when we were working on these emergency use authorization applications, was the need to consider ethnic factors in the acceptability of foreign data. We noted that quite a number of the applications we had received during this period did not take into consideration our ethnic group. So from the training, we picked all these key things, and these were some of the very important things that we quickly identified from data that we received. Next slide, please. On the issue of networking, uh, we got in touch with a lot of our colleagues from the other regulatory agencies, South Africa and Zimbabwe. We are still together. We send each other messages. Some of us are still on our group chat platforms where we share information and learn from each other. Some of us are actually still in touch with some of the facilitators that participated in the program whenever we have challenges and they quickly respond to our emails uh, when we send them messages. 
and also uh, from information we we obtain from some of our in-house uh, colleagues in terms of clinical review we share with other colleagues also out of our region that's were part of the training program so basically this was this has been the impact for us in ghana after the training uh, that ended in october thank you very much thank you so much for that we will then take um, the next presentation from mcas Ms. rutendo Thank you very much and good day to everyone. I will be sharing my screen for the presentation. I can you confirm if you can see my screen. Yes, we can. OK. I'm Rutendo Kazungi with the Medicines Control Authority of Zimbabwe, and I am a regulatory assessor in the Evaluations and Registration Division. I'll be giving a general feedback of the training that the training course that we had last year. Okay, so first and foremost, I'd like to express our gratitude to the organizers of the program, the funders, as well as our agency for the opportunity that they gave us to take part in this training program. So generally, when we got the invitation to be part of the course, when we saw the duration of the whole course, uh, the amount of work that was supposed to be done, we thought it would be very overwhelming, but we are glad to say that uh, the course was generally well paced and we managed to sail through the whole 12 weeks of the program. Um, generally, the training was very practical and very informative. It was very intensive, as said, as the other speakers said, we had a lot of reading, self-study that we were supposed to do, a lot of group work, and um, we also were supposed to uh, attend some tutorials. But then, as I've said before, um, it was well structured and the course managed to be well paced, so we were able to go through the whole program um, if, uh, successfully. Uh, we had a very useful interactive exercises during the program, and the organizers of the course made sure that our objectives for the course were met uh, throughout the whole program. The course was overly well structured. Our facilitators were well versed in all the areas that they were supposed to present in. And it was also a joy to be able to rub shoulders with the gurus of clinical data assessment in Africa and other continents, as well as other um, in other parts of the training, we also got to be in touch with industry and sponsors to get a view of their side of with regards to clinical data assessment. Uh, what we can say from the training is that um, as regulatory officers from MCAZ, we are generally better equipped to assess clinical study data whenever we receive opportunities within our authority. Uh, from the team from MCAZ, we had direct uh, letter officers from the Evaluations and Registration Division. We also had some officers away from our Pharmacovigilance and Clinical Trials Unit. So um, generally, um, from what we got from the course, some have been able to use this information during their work from day-to-day -day work. Uh, with, uh, of note is that uh, most of our assessors in the clinical trials division have been able to use most of the information that they learned during their day-to-day -day work. But as uh, we have been hearing from the presentations here, we generally do not receive a lot of dossiers that are clinical study data as a continent. But then, as we note that uh, due to the various changes due to COVID-19, we are slowly receiving uh, various information from various countries and dossiers that actually have clinical study data. And due to the number of dossiers that we've been receiving, we are slowly beginning to get opportunities to make use of the information that we learned during the 12-week course that we had last year. We therefore hope that uh, as time goes on, we are able to make full use of the knowledge that we gained during the course to sharpen our skills as regulatory assessors and also to make our regulatory functions as an organization better so that it can run better um, as time goes on. And as we can see, uh, as I've noted before, uh, most of the less, 
information that we've acquired, we've not been able to fully use it, uh, but then we are hoping to do so um, in the coming years. Uh, in conclusion, what I'd like to say is as MCAZ, we we'll definitely recommend the course to all other regulatory professionals who wish to pursue a career in clinical state data, because as we've mentioned, the course was pegged and we managed to get a lot of information that will help us um, during the assessment of clinical study data, I would definitely recommend this to other people who would like to take go through the course. Um, so this would be the end of my presentation. Thank you so much to the three of you. Um, we will um, take questions after the next presentation. So please do continue to put your questions on the um, chat platform and we will then um, respond to those. Our last presentation for this um, for today will be from Dr. Stephen Ghani, who is the CEO of the regulatory agency in Botswana. Stephen, over to you. Do we have Stephen uh, on the... Ah, there we go. Are you able to, to load the presentation on that side? Okay, we will do so. Is it, is it is it possible for you to show on your side? It seems we don't have your presentation. Let me try this side uh, to me. Okay, we can see it if you could just put it on slideshow mode. Is that is that better now? That's great. Thank you. Over to you, please. Great. Uh, thanks. Thanks to me. Uh, thanks for inviting me to uh, make a presentation. I've been listening to uh, all the good work done by the, uh, I would say the the, the Premier League of Regulators. Um, I'm, I'm, uh, we are only a young regulator, about three years old. Uh, still in uh, WHO maturity level one. And therefore, I've been I've been listening to all the good work, as I said. There's a lot of uh, capacity building that's taking place on the continent. I can see that. And and to me, as you know, that uh, you know, a young team joining the Premier League, uh, we are we are very good at coaching some of those skilled uh, employees that you you may have. But in any case, this time around, we're not coaching, but we're just we're just a young team. Um, My my presentation is about the WHO competency framework, and I'm just going to focus uh, uh, the presentation to this, and, and try and leave out uh, the pre-qualification because of time constraints. Trying to move, it's frozen.
just uh, just a minute. I'm sorry about that. Uh, uh, technical glitches once again. Uh, I'll just start making a, just a short introduction. And then move on to the competency framework, our experiences through the framework and the challenges. And what do you propose to be uh, interventions? I think I'm having challenges now. Maybe just keep it on um, a mode that's not slideshow. Hopefully that helps. Okay. Just just a, a way of general you know, comment on the uh, NRAs and the Sadek region. Uh, to see that from our observation in Bombra, just to start it off, there are really some gaps in the legislative framework. And most of the countries are working on uh, the legislation to try to see how they can amend it to the AU model law, for example, and take into consideration the WHO requirements. And therefore, there is quite some inadequacy in regulatory capacity itself. Much of it uh, the contribution comes from the legislative deficiencies. Uh, there's an uh, element of any adequate resources, uh, both financial and, and human. Uh, I must say it also post the COVID-19, there's been a lot of financial stress on, on this kind on our countries. And uh, finding resources now to uh, increase uh, human uh, personal competency as competencies is quite a difficult journey uh, for us. And there is insufficient IT support infrastructure to support our, our work. As for regulatory capacity building in the region, uh, there have been some initiatives to try to build capacity in the region. For example, there is a regional harmonization, the Zazibona web sharing platform, Avarev. Uh, there have been some WHO initiated trainings. Uh, there have been some trainings from WHO on pre qualification. There's also the World Bank facilitated uh, medicines regulatory harmonization trainings at regional level, as well as the ARCO facilitated trainings. Uh, for example, from AMCAS, from EDCTP. There was a uh, training last week in, in Harare organized by, by AMCAS uh, on biosimilars. That is an example of such training uh, for our regional assessors. Yes, and then there are also several trainings initiatives that we carry out at national levels. Um, However, in many areas, the criteria employed in the planning and of trainings or individual development plans is not well structured or coordinated. So historically, really for the region, uh, including for uh, ourselves, the training for regulators has been largely uncoordinated with no clear objectives, uh, sometimes uh, conflicting agendas, even when you look at ourselves as a region, the agenda is not aligned, it's not the same um, or similar. 
uh, sometimes the training doesn't really address the need. And I had one of the presenters earlier saying that there's a risk that some of the trainings may never be implemented or used in practice. And that could be one of those cases where, uh, for example, where the training doesn't address the need. Now, the, when the WHO framework, computer the framework was introduced, it, 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 it promised to uh, bring to us a systemic, a systematic uh, approach to support the training and professional development of regulatory personnel in the in the NRAs. As, as a way of principle, the framework uh, was a combination of the behaviors, including the technical practices uh, that uh, regulatory uh, personnel would go through, uh, starting with them in that being a level one beginner stage and moving up the trajectory to uh, uh, become proficient and ultimately to become expert in the in their work. The common courses of competency frameworks have been uh, presented, uh, been shared. Uh, lack of knowledge, lack of experience, lack of, uh, of, of practice, um, sometimes inadequate time uh, allocated to, to try to gain these skills uh, and, and manage social management. Uh, potential interventions, um, uh, there are areas of self-study uh, where it can be applied, uh, mentorship, uh, collaboration and, and benchmarking for the right reasons, of course, and shadowing. These are all the opportunities that are there uh, to support uh, capacity development. Uh, the WHO competency framework itself uh, brought in the, 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 the aspects of, of job leveling in that uh, and, uh, a technical officer at level one, at, at beginner stage, it would be different from the expectations we have at level two, which is the competence of the, the proficient level, and also from the expert level. Uh, the, the practice activities, the opportunities, we brought in opportunities for uh, practice activities. Uh, and of course, uh, there were benefits to the players themselves, the NRAs. Uh, this competency framework was uh, had uh, play a big, big role in, in performance management and assessments in the learning and development competencies, succession and uh, resource management, recruitment in career uh, planning. And for the pharmaceutical industry, for example, there will be gains in terms of uh, the consistency of the work done, for example, uh, assessments, outcomes, and, and reduced uh, turnaround times. Um, for the providers of training and learning, uh, it would be easier for needs assessment uh, to be done and to establish appropriate training programs uh, and shape curricula according to global competitiveness uh, uh, benchmarks. And of course, for the healthcare and practitioners themselves, uh, uh, that will allow for timely access to uh, uh, products of high quality, uh, safety and efficacy. We are having another challenge. Do you maybe want to with us? It, it, nevertheless, your messages have come through very clearly. Mm. To me, I think I was interrupting you. No, no. Um, I just wanted to find out from Stephen if he wants to come out of um, PowerPoint slideshow mode, if that will help. I don't know how many more slides you have, Stephen. I've got quite just quite just a few uh, to me. I might I might just try to. Yeah, I think I'll come out of the slideshow. Um, in, in our experiences uh, as uh, as Bomra, um, 
uh, especially during the COVID pandemic, we realized that we have to, we have to be very responsive. Uh, and we are called upon to, to up our game uh, with regards to regulation of medical devices, for example, assessment of vaccines for, for EUL. Uh, there was, of course, limited expertise uh, with the right skills, competencies to assess these products. Uh, and the assessments had to be done on very tight timelines. Um, but going back to the framework itself, uh, the framework is actually is a very good tool. Uh, it's a very promising good tool, somewhat complex, of course, uh, but there was limited time uh, to take the NRA stuff through the frameworks, both in, uh, in Botswana and also in other countries. There is need for, uh, I think, proper piloting of the competency model. It was delayed in some respects. It wasn't a smooth uh, project. And in, in a way that, you know, sometimes we introduce very good projects and they get delayed in the in the process, which uh, tends to affect uh, the, the, the rate at which we can build competencies to support industry growth. Uh, our proposed solutions here was to, uh, and, and I've been speaking to WHO again and asking them that we might have to reintroduce the refresher courses uh, for the NRAs because there's been a lack of time now uh, between the last time they, we had contact. Uh, most of us and have now adopted the framework. We need to go and get on and, and implement it uh, to expedite uh, uh, piloting. That is a requirement that I think uh, it would to, to greatly help. Uh, and the pilot could do more by including more SADC member states uh, uh, Barmara has been earmarked for this pilot. Um, I think the all in all, really, to conclude, the, the tool has been has been very very good, but there have been a delays. So I think the project was not properly implemented, and there's room for improvement. Uh, and I think as an race, we need to work with WHO uh, to see how better and how more competently uh, we can engage and improve. Uh, our work and our career development for employees uh, uh, through the use of the tool. Uh, thank you. I'm very sorry about the uh, the, the, this, the the presentation. It, 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 there was hiccup, hiccups, and that, those were not anticipated. I'm sorry about that. Thank, thank you, you. Uh, to me. Yeah. Thank you, Stephen. No worries. I think it, it is expected um, with with technology, and and your presentation was very helpful. I do know that we are way over when it comes to time, eight minutes over, and we do have um, the opening um, ceremony taking place in about an hour. So, um, so I think we will touch on these some of these themes um, in tomorrow's session. Um, when uh, uh, Colin opens, we can just align Colin in terms of what we will cover. But I think overall, um, a number of questions that were posed on the virtual platform have been responded to. Um, Colin, what, what I took away from the discussion is, you know, I think support um, from various um, individuals representing various institutions to say how do how do they assist, how do they assist uh, with the um, mentorship uh, program, um, how do they assist us in this continuous uh, learning platform, how can we work with industry? There was a specific question around how do we work with industry around this? And so I think it definitely um, creates room for us to engage further as we think about um, expanding this program. Um, I mean, we did have a conversation earlier, as Bernd mentioned, that how do we engage industry um, in this? And so certainly conversations that we are um, very happy to have. I think the questions around collaborative review um, uh, mechanisms available um, to us on the continent. Stephen, I think you spoke quite um, uh, eloquently um, to what is available and, and how we work. And I just want to touch on one point. Um, you know, you've heard um, Eric and Stephen talk about maturity level, and all of us aspire to either be maturity level three or four. And that speaks to um, you know, your um, as a regulator um, mechanisms and processes that you have internally to be able to apply reliance, that you've got good quality management systems, um, that your processes are robust, and that 
other regulators can rely on the work that you do. And therefore, um, all of us as regulators are really aspiring to either be ML3 or ML4 um, as we um, work towards strengthening our capability um, on, you know, on, on, on the continent. And so I just wanted to touch on that. Um, Colin, before I give over to you, I wonder, Bernd, if you've got any um, comments, concluding comments that you want to make, and then we'll hand over to Colin. Uh, thank you very much, um, especially also the last presentation about the WHO co competency framework has, has shown clearly that there are various initiatives and um, again, I think one should not work in silos um, and I would like also to mention that we have um, with uh, Luther Quasa, someone from the WHO in our team um, who makes that connection, so it should not be separate efforts um, running in parallel. But um, what we need to do in future is more and more work together to come to, towards the joint effort and the joint goal. And with this, I would like to hand it over to Colin. So, so thanks, thanks to me, thanks Burns, thanks all the speakers. I mean, the, 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 the session today was really intended to be around general capacity development. Uh, this is, we are attached to a meeting of pharmacometrics but the theme was about general capacity development. And we spent quite a bit of time getting different perspectives on that pilot program. Uh, so as, as Tumi says, let's, we'll pick up some of the themes tomorrow. Uh, I'm excited that so many of you joined. I'm also excited that you know, regulatory is firmly on the agenda uh, for our conversations here. So tomorrow when we switch gears a little bit, it will be around something novel for the continent. And that's about how do we get capacity development around uh, the quantitative sciences, the modeling and simulation, pharmacometrics? Uh, so from, from my side, thank you very much as your virtual chair today. Uh, let me really give it back to Tumi to formally close us down in, in the room there. Thanks, Tumi. Thank, thank you so much. <laughs> you see, we collaborate quite well. Huh? <laughs> no, thank you so much, everyone. And we look forward to seeing you um, at the opening um, session that's starting in a few uh, minutes time. And do join us again tomorrow. We would still like to learn a lot from you um, around this topic of pharmacometrics. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a good evening. <laughs>